Okay, so, um, so it's going to be something different. I sort of agonized on this, and I, like, Lord, it, it, it happened first thing Sunday. First off, God is good. All the time. And all the time? God is good. Amen. Um, we played Psalm 46. Be still. Oh, Father, I don't know what to do. You've given me a word. Give me a task to do. I can't let this person... I can't let this person not be remembered. Oh, God. Don't let this one be forgotten. I pray you use this rusted bag of bones as a fragrant offering. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So I have, I'm gonna, what, what I'm going to do is there is some scriptures to share. Uh, I have a copy of She Was Only 22. The Lord told me, you will read this aloud during worship, during the message. This is my message, he says. God said this is my message, not, not Eris, it's, it's his. And there's some scriptures that go with it. The message is called, A Fragrant Offering. Be still. Uh, Helen Ewan, be, quote unquote, be, be, for her Lord Jesus. So it's a fragrant offering. Um, Nina, do you want a copy? Uh, you, you want to follow along? Anybody else want to follow along? Here. Sam, give that to Jay. Sam, you want to follow along again? Mm -hmm. Give one to Elijah. No. I don't know what's up here, me too. Where did, did Marvin go? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. So, um, this is a message. I pray to God, I beg, if I have to cry and hold your legs and, and, and go with you home, till finally you say, okay, I see what you're trying to say, I'll do it. I've given my life for this Jesus, because he's given his life for me. You guys just follow along, and I'm just going to read, because this is very important. This is written by Dr. James Alexander Stewart. He was around, he was alive 1910 to 1975, very powerful ministry, especially in Russia, gospel ministry. Uh, it's still going on today in Asheville, North Carolina, I believe. The story of Helen Ewan of Scotland, a fragrant, dynamic life. She's only 22. God, you got to help me read through this. In one sense, Helen Ewan was an ordinary, common Christian. And in another, she was an extraordinary one. Her brief Christian life of eight years was filled with the fragrance and glory of God. It was filled with blessings to both saint and sinner. Today, many years after her translation, thousands still are being inspired and challenged through her life. Some of my friends who also knew Helen believe that the story of her life is too sacred to reveal publicly. But I felt the continu continuous urge of the spirit to pass on the message of her life to a cold church, an unbelieving world. 
I feel a great responsibility, as I suppose I knew her better than I know on par from her father and mother, through our adventures in soul winning together in the industrial city of Glasgow. Although we were the same age, Helen was my friend only in a spiritual sense. What an inspiration she was to me. Her whole being was poured out in rich devotion to the Christ who had redeemed her. Yours in Calvary's Bonds, James Alexander Stewart, March 1966. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. So the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of, our, of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. At the same time that I was saved during the mighty movement of God in my city of Glasgow, a girl about the same age was saved. Her name was Helen Ewan. She was just a slip of a girl, but at the very threshold of her new life in Christ, she crowned him as absolute Lord and was thus filled with the Holy Spirit. She had accepted the invitation of her Lord to drink abundantly. At the, uh, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. The torrents of living water simply began to flow from Helen's life. Helen Ewan was born around 1910 into an ordinary working class family. She was the only child. Both of her parents loved Christ supremely. The blessed Son of God was the center around which the whole household revolved. They lived for only one thing, and that was to please God in every detail of their lives. Three well-marked Bibles were always conspicuous in their living room when I visited them. After her conversion at the age of 14, Helen's whole personality was radiant with the glory of the Lord. God in his sovereign grace had shown into her darkened soul in order that through this ordinary earthen work container might be manifested the surpassing majesty of the power of the gospel. This manifestation of his glory astonished us all. Hers was only a common life, but it was lit up with the glory of God. I often wondered how she could stand so much. Mm. So much glory in her fragile earthen work container. Being full of the Holy Spirit, she was full of Christ. As she studied the Word of God under the illuminating guidance of the Holy Spirit, he took the treasures of the Lord Jesus and revealed them unto her. This made her heart dance for joy. Many times she would stop Christians on the street with radiant face and tell of some choice portion of scripture where she had found some new picture of her blessed Redeemer. His friends often left her presence weeping. They said, we have seen Jesus. We have looked into his glorious face. The awe of God remained upon their souls throughout the remainder of the day. Like Spurgeon, she was at her very best when she told us of her Lord. It was at such times she stood out as a solitary figure, so far removed from the rest of us. She knew the Lord in such a deep, intimate way. Many testified that just her passing smile or her cheery good day, God bless you, <coughs> was an uplifting tonic to them the rest of the day. In her prayer life, Helen was such an example to us all. She rose each morning around 5 o'clock to commune with her Lord. She would not put on the heat in her cold little room or seek to make herself comfortable in any way, feeling she could be more alert in the cold. And besides, those for whom she would be praying in foreign lands were not sitting in comfort. She would begin her communion with praise and worship. 
She then read the word to warm her heart. She remembered the words of her fellow Scott, R. Murray McShane. It is the look that saves, but it is the gaze that sanctifies. Mm. Helen gazed with rapture into the face of her ward. I could mention to you the Expressions of adoration as she wrote down in her diary after such times with her Lord. They're too sacred for publication. After fellowship and communion, followed her ministry of intercession for her friends and family, for her assembly for hundreds of missionaries on the foreign fields. Then came her prayer ministry for the unsaved. She had a list of unsaved persons to whom she had testified and for whom she had prayed daily until they were born again. Her yearnings after the salvation of the lost were awful to behold. The reason God gave her so many souls among rich and poor, young and old, illiterate and intelligent, was that she agonized for them in earnest intercession inside the veil. There was nothing vague or general about her pleas. After her quote-unquote translation, her mother kindly allowed me to go over her diaries, and there I saw that the petitions expressed in them were strong and definite. She gave the date when she began to pray for a person, and then the date when the prayer was answered. These diaries revealed a prayer life that moved God and man. No wonder that when God promoted her to glory at the age of 22, many wept throughout Scotland, and missionaries in far-off lands felt they had lost the greatest prayer warrior. Not only at the early morning hour did Helen commit to her Lord the whole of the new day with all that it entailed, but all through the day she sought guidance in matters small and great. It was no small thing for her to shop for some personal piece of clothing, and she might be seen to pause in front of a store to seek his guidance at before going there for a piece of ribbon. She must please him in all things. She would not be led by the traditions of men. That, no doubt, explains the remark of her friends that Helen was always dressed right. Amen. Helen seeking after long souls, excuse me, lost souls also put us all to shame. Here again she seemed to rise head and shoulders above us all, even among thousands. of believers in our great city at that time. I had been out on the streets of Glasgow near midnight with my tract and gospel text boards on many occasions when I would see Helen busy in her own method of personal soul willing, winning. I have seen her on a cold Scottish winter's evening with her arms around a poor drunken prostitute telling her of Jesus and his love. On other occasions she would be dealing with drunken men seeking to lead them to her savior. Helen, uh, in the evangelistic meetings, she was always on the alert for lost souls. Sitting near the rear of the, of the building, she would see a woman sitting alone, sorrow written on her face and weariness in her eyes. Under the guidance of the Spirit, Helen would slip over and sit beside her, praying inwardly during the whole of the service. When the lady arose to leave, Helen would leave with her, talking about the message and encouraging the lady to unburden her heart. This way, more than one soul who is burdened with the cares of this life and bowed down with the weight of sin and despair which led to know the Savior as Helen pointed her to the Lamb of God under the lamppost or while waiting near the streetcar shop. When finally she entered the University of Glasgow, she used to walk several miles from her home to the varsity each day so that she could distribute tracts along the way. At the same time, she could save the streetcar fare and give it to the missionary cause. Needless to say, she had the joy of leading many students to Christ on the campus. Robert Murray McShane used to seal his letters with a sketch of the sun going down behind the mountains and with the motto over it, the night cometh. It was the same feeling of urgency that drew Helen on. Like Murray McShane and Samuel Rutherford, Helen carried the fragrance of Christ with her. And like William C. Burns, she manifested the power of the Spirit. Her body was a walking temple of the Holy Spirit. Thus, wherever she went, the power of God was manifested. When she entered into any service, immediately the atmosphere was charged with his power. I have known her to slip quietly into a prayer meeting, 
which had already begun and set on the back seat, yet every one of us knew that she had arrived because of the mighty sense of the presence of God manifested in our midst. Evangelists often saw it after her service. It was not that she could sing or speak in public. I do not think she ever sang a solo or give a public testimony in any of their campaigns. All she did was sit quietly in the meetings and pray. Yet these evangelists knew that if they could only have Helen attend their services, there would be sure to be a mighty anointing upon the meeting. Some leading evangelists have told me that she was the most remarkable person they ever knew in this way. One outstanding English evangelist, when an aged warrior testified that possibly the greatest campaign he ever conducted was one in which Helen was able to attend every service for two weeks while she was on her vacation. I was talking one day with two professors from the University of London. They were believers. We were talking about dynamic Christianity when one of them suddenly said, Brother Stewart, I want to tell you a story. And he wanted, went on to tell of a remarkable young lady on the campus of the Glasgow University when he was lecturing there. Wherever she went on the campus, he said the fragrance of Christ followed her. For example, a group of unconverted students would be jesting and telling dirty stories when someone would say, suddenly, shh, shh, here she comes, quiet. And this young lady would walk by, unconsciously leaving the power and the awe of the presence of God behind her. He said that in the university prayer meetings, they could always tell this young student was present whether she prayed or not, or they could tell when she entered the room without hearing or seeing her. They sensed the presence of God in their midst. I said, sir, that could be only one person. That was Helen Ewan. Yes, he answered, that was her name. She was a remarkable soul winner. Another feature of Helen's life was her deep appetite for the word of God and a deep spiritual penetration into divine truth. She did not just leaf through her Bible for palatable portions which suited her fancy at the moment. She studied the whole book, from Genesis to Revelation. Thus she became a deeply intelligent child of God. Even at the age of 16 and 17, her feet were firmly placed on the solid rock of the Holy Scriptures. Even when she was a hard-working student, her secular studies in the university Seeking to make good grades for his glory, she still gave time for Bible study and meditation. This made her a well-balanced Christian. Though there was no time or place in her life for idle gossip or foolish talk, she bubbled over with a clean humor and zest for life. And yet, because Christ filled the whole of her horizon, she sought to magnify him through a holy life and sacrificial service. Every growing girl has her own heroes and heroines. Helen was no different. Her favorite character was one of the Wigtown martyrs of the Covenanting days in Scotland, Margaret Wilson. For those who don't know who Margaret Wilson was, one of the required books as a disciple of Christ should be Fox's Book of Martyrs, should be <coughs> bless it, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, any version that you could read, and Fair Sunshine, written by Jock Purvis, about Scottish Covenanters, by whom the pilgrims of this country, our forefathers, came, the Scottish Presbyterians. Margaret Wilson was one of the young ladies who was told swear allegiance to the king as head of the church and in all matters of the church has full authority and she said I will take no filthy oaths and they buried her with sand up to her neck they said say it no filthy oaths for me because she said Jesus Christ is my king and the tide came in slowly, slowly. And they, people screamed, girl, you have so many years ahead of you. No filthy oaths for me. To Jesus I come and to Jesus I go. Mm -hmm. She was martyred. Mm -hmm. How? They torturally drowned her by the sea. Cold, 
icy water off the coast of Scotland. That was Helen Ewan's hero. That's the stock she came from. It was of such rugged stock she came from, uh, <coughs> she might not be asked to die for her redeemer, as was Margaret Wilson, but by his grace she would live for him each moment of every day. At the university, Helen was preparing herself for missionary service among the Russian people of Eastern Europe, where I myself was later to labor. Already she was learning the Russian language in preparation for her life's ministry. But God in his wisdom and love called her home at the age of 22. She had been spending her vacation with an aunt in the kingdom of Fife, and while there she was continually about her master's business. She was taken ill suddenly, and as suddenly was called home. It was so unexpected that it shocked us all. And I'm sure if you guys knew Leanne, that's how it was there. So suddenly it came and so suddenly she was gone. I was laboring at the time in an evangelistic campaign in a city in Northern England. When the news reached me of Helen's home going, I was stunned. I could neither eat nor sleep. So great was my grief that the people were amazed to learn that this young lady from my city was no more to me than a spiritual friend and companion, not my fiance. How is it possible, they asked, that a young man could be so broken down over the loss of anyone, especially only a friend? I was not alone in my sorrow. Thousands wept throughout Scotland and Great Britain. Many sought to express something of the blessing this life had meant to them. For instance, at one memorial service, a great Christian leader stood and told the audience of how Helen's spirituality had so deeply affected him. I was old enough to be her father, he said. I had known the Lord many years longer than she had known him, but still she seemed so far ahead of me spiritually. On far off mission stations, British missionaries grieved at the news. Alas, who would bear them up so faithfully at the throne of grace now? Who would step into this gap and take her place? Even many years later, when I would begin again in Glasgow, one of the most thrilling experiences was to be with a group of Christian friends who would be sharing with each other something of what this dedicated, radiant life had meant to us uh, personally. The very mention of her name had a charm, an irresistible force that drove one to his knees to cry out, Oh God, raise up others like Helen Ewan. Oh God, make me, even me, a better man for your glory. Sometime later, when I had a few days free from my evangelistic meetings, I visited the cemetery where Helen had been laid to rest in order to once again give God thanks for such a life. There I knelt before God and laid myself anew upon his altar, pleading that the fire of God would fall on even me. One of the grave diggers to whom I spoke could not at first recall anyone having buried there at such as I described to him. You must remember that we are burying large numbers of people here. This is a public cemetery, he explained. As I went on speaking, however, this strong, sturdy laborer became deeply moved. Yes, I remember now, he said. When we were burying that body, I felt the presence of God all over this place. Now, dear reader, what is the explanation of such a life? How could a young woman, still pursuing her studies, Never having preached a sermon or sung a solo. Never having traveled more than 200 miles away from her home. How could her life so affected people in all parts of the world that they felt a mighty general had fallen? The word of God says, one of you shall chase a thousand, two shall put 10,000 to flight. Helen Ewan's life had been more worth more than a thousand ordinary Christians in the church. And the story of her life translated into many different languages has continued to bless many today. What I say is the explanation. There is only one explanation. She's filled with the Holy Spirit. Helen, who was an ordinary young woman, became extraordinary simply because she surrendered all to Christ and appropriated for herself all that was hers in Him. She, with unveiled face, took time to receive and thus reflected the glory of the Lord as she passed from one degree of glory to another. We all mirror the glory of the Lord in some degree, but if we are to perfectly mirror His glory, there are three things that must be true of us. One, the mirror must be clean. 
A dirty mirror does not give a true reflection. Two, the mirror must be kept clean. In Bible days, when mirrors were made of polished metal, they had to be kept polished to be of any use. And the mirror of your life must be kept clean and polished if it is to perfectly and consistently reflect the glory of the Lord. Three, the mirror must be in place. It must face the object to be reflected. You must have both eyes on Christ, the whole life looking unto Him, if you would reflect His glory. May you, dear reader, be so fully surrendered to your Lord that you will, like Helen Ewan, fully reflect the glory of the Lord. Let this be your prayer with Francis Ridley Havergal. In full and glad surrender, I give myself to thee, thine utterly and only, and ever more to be. O Son of God, who lovest me, I'll be thine alone. And all I have and all I can shall henceforth be thine own. Reign over me, Lord Jesus, O make my heart thy throne. It shall be thine, dear Savior, it shall be thine alone. O come and reign, Lord Jesus, rule over everything, and keep me always loyal and true to thee, my King. Go to Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth trembles, the mountains topple, the news media go nuts, the political situation in this country, Taiwan fearing invasion, mandated vaccines, the economy fluctuating like nuts, people scared to death, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake, with its turmoil, there's a river. You guys get that? Do you guys understand? All this fretting is wasting his time. You could be with unveiled face before your king. Instead, how many Things are distracting you. What's distracting you? I can't answer those questions. I know what's distracting me. And I, I'm going to have to talk to the king. If I was to die tonight, he said, son, why don't you get this out of your face? I tell, I tell you, get this away from you. There's a river. Its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. Where is the third temple? This is the third temple. There's a river. Did not Jesus say, and he's speaking of the Holy Spirit, we read this in Hel Nguyen, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He was talking of the Holy Spirit. There is a river. The its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. That river is here, out of your belly. Is your plumbing clean? Have you rotor rooted? Have you had a holy rotor rooter in you? If not, you better get before Him on, on your face. Lord, change me. I, cut me. Cut me deep. I don't care what you're going to do to me. Do it. Please, I don't want anything anymore. Cut me deep. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. And here it comes. As God is in the midst of you, in the midst of his people, nations rage and kingdoms topple. Guys, there's nothing out there. I'm going to tell you that right now. There is absolutely nothing out there. Stop looking at the news. Stop looking at... If you need to know what it is, would not the Holy Spirit bring it to you? Yeah. We do not need to say, well, I, I, I want to keep uh, uh, informed and updated. All you need to know is Jesus is King, and you just, just rejoice in that. 
You don't need to know anything about the kingdoms are going to rise and fall. Who cares? Did you hear that Jim Bob Baloney stink died? Yeah, and so did everybody else. I struggled with that. I, I did. And Leanne was like, uh, who is that person? Huh, you're right. It really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. People will come and go. Nations come and go. The only thing you need to remember, every stinking eye will behold him when he comes with the clouds. With his... Woo! Thousands and ten thousands and ten thousands, myriad of angels. Jesus coming to take us home. Jesus coming to reign. The earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Are you in that secret place? Now, I'm not talking about your own personal prayer closet. Susanna Wesley uh, had an apron. She had 16 kids, 20 kids. She had a lot of children. And she did this. I believe it was Susanna Wesley. Correct me if I'm wrong. Cover herself with her apron. She says, I'm going to be with Jesus right now. Leave me alone. Go ahead and, and, and have nine boys and find a quiet place to do your, your devotional time. It's, it's got to be that precious to you. Now, here's what God's going to do. And this is the second part of the message. Let me, let me finish one thought. Are you for him? And I'm not talking allegiance. As Helen Ewan, do you seek? I want to make a name for, for the Lord. You don't need to make a name for him. His name is already made. His name is the name above all, every name. His name is already there. Stop trying to make a name for yourself. Stop trying to make a name for God. Enough, it's there. You just serve, you just be. So put your finger on that Psalm 46 and go to Isaiah. You guys love the word? Amen. Yes. Go to Isaiah. Uh, stand by. Thirty, verse fifteen. Here, Jerusalem was warned. Uh, excuse me. All of Judah was warned. This was before the exile. Through the prophet Isaiah, God was begging His people. Verse fifteen. For the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, "You will be delivered." By returning or repentance and resting. Returning and resting. Your strength will lie or remain in quiet confidence. Here is where they failed. But you are not willing. You say, no, we will escape on horses and therefore we will escape and ride on fast horses. But those who pursue you will be faster. One thousand will flee at the threat of one. And at the threat of five, you will flee. Until you alone remain, like a solitary pole on a mountain or banner on top of a hill. One of the worst things is for you to be alone. I'm not talking, be alone. I'm not talking about being alone with Jesus. When you are forsaken. Because you refused to be in an attitude and life of daily repentance. Daily keeping that mirror clean. He said, no, I want to try it myself. I want to make a name for the Lord. Stop. You're out of service. Just rest. Stop doing in order to be pleasing to Him. Stop. That very doing to be pleasing is a filthy rag. It is a menstrual cloth it is, a, it is a tampon forgive me for the language that has been sitting on the table for 10 days it's, it's used 
God says, you trying to be acceptable to me. You, you're not letting me wash over you. You keep going trying to be acceptable. Last time I checked, in my Bible it says, your life is hid with Christ and God. If God says, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, not you are my beloved son, what you do pleases me. No. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In whom, in whom a person... Who you are defines what you do. If you're a child of God, you're going to do the works of God. How do we do the works of God? John 6. Believe in the one he has sent. Well, how do we do that? They didn't get it. This is how you do it. Lord, okay, I don't know what to do. I keep trying to earn your favor. This is not particularly an evangelistic message to unbelievers. Rather, it's to the church. We keep trying to work for God. This is a message to also keep trying to keep failing. God tell, is telling you, this is, this is a very unusual message. God put this before me. I said, Lord, okay. So yesterday I asked again, what do you want me to talk to your people? And he said, did I not give you the message to speak? Okay. This is the message he has for you. This is a message for everybody who's listening online. Do you not understand? You just need to rest and let him wash over you. I am not saying stop praying. I'm not saying agonize and labor. I'm not saying that. Case in point. What angle, or better illustration, how does this paper look? Wide, small, tall, tall, flat, white. Now, how does it look? Which perspective are you seeing? Flat, horizontal, line. This is not the same as this. Is the paper any different? No. No, it's still paper. So, what God is trying to communicate to all that are listening is, son, I want to, son, daughter, I want to do something different. I want to highlight a different, uh, bring a different perspective that you didn't see. The ancient rabbis would say God's like a diamond. Every time you move the diamond, you see a different facet of who he is. He's still that diamond, but you see the light shine differently through that facet of the diamond. One looks like this, one looks like this. It, it's, it's, it's like, or like a prism. It's probably a better way to, 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 to illustrate. When God is trying to communicate, all this fretting, this frenetic running around, trying to do this, trying to do, just be delighted to serve. Take that position Stop trying to make money. Stop trying to pursue a career. Just stop it. You have no career. Careers are for the people out there. We do not follow careers. We follow Jesus Christ. And we do his bidding. And we serve him. Yet we so, our eyes so get stuck here on this earth. We get so frustrated. Because things aren't happening the way... They're supposed to happen. Or this task is not being done. Or, this is not what I signed up for. Doesn't matter. You're called to serve. Serve in the wood shop. Serve out there, you know, in, 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 a, in, in, a, in a gym or wherever you are. Sir, look at it that you don't deserve a minute of your pre presence being there. You don't deserve to be in that spot that you are in, but you are there because the Most High King said, Child, I ordained for you to be there, and that's where I want you to be, and I want you to give me everything right there to that child, to that patient, to that piece of machinery that you're working on, to that lumber, to whatever. I want your heart 
there. I want that. Your presence there is the vehicle of my kingdom. You don't know it. You don't see it. Where is your faith? You believe. You say you believe, but you don't believe. But you're fretting and you're complaining. I've had enough of it, and I'm trying to get your attention. And you keep doubting. You keep complaining. Or, or, or moms that stay at home. How is this worth it to any of it, God? Every diaper I clean, every snotty nose I wipe. He said, child, I put you in that position. That's my kingdom. Because I want my faithfulness proved through you in that moment. Because at the end, when it's all over, I'm going to show you. I'm going to play it for you. Say, look, I was faithful. I was faithful. You were frustrated and I came to you. You were frustrated and I came to you. You doubted and I came to you. You agonized and I came to you. You were sad and I came to you. You wanted to quit and I came to you. You wanted to give up and I came to you. You cried and I came to you. You lost and I came to you and I saved you from potentially killing your children. I can say that because there were times Leanne wanted to and I'm not joking. I can say that and I'm not tearing her down. Yes, she was a wonderful woman. I loved her dearly and I'll give my life for her. But she was human. The beginning of our marriage. She was a very stressed out mom. And she struggled. Part of it was my fault. Because I was very controlling. And I didn't give her that time. I, didn't, I was very scared. I had a, my own set of insecurities. And got it to deal with me. And she was always afraid. She said, she would tell me, she says, honey, I don't know what to do. I'm always afraid I'm going to be like one of those women who drowned her children in the bathtub. That would be me. And God proved his faithfulness by taking her home. And he says, well done, my child. You didn't give up. The purpose of your life is not to commit some sort of wonderful act for God. The purpose of your life is to give your proof that he's faithful. Because at the end, he's going to say, well done, you excellent performing servant. Is he going to say that? Well done, you excellent carpenter. No. Faithful. Faithful. Did you quit? I'm not saying did you fall down, but did you quit? You can fall forward and get back up. That's what he's doing with you. That's what he wants through you. That's what he wants to show. That's what he wants to magnify. Because at the end of time, he's going to unveil his bride and he's going to say, well, one, Revelation says, behold, salvation belongs to our God. The church is revealed. And everybody, every nation, tribe, and tongue is going to say, like Balaam, or Balaam said, Uh, how beautiful are your tents, O Jacob. I see, whoa, that's a people blessed of the Lord. God is surely in their midst. And that's Psalm 46 as well. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is a stronghold. And now we're brought here. Come see the works of the Lord who brings devastation on the earth. He makes wars to cease throughout the earth. He shatters bows and cuts spears into pieces. He burns up the chariots. Stop your fighting. Stop it. Stop your grumbling. Stop your arguing. Sit still with your hand over your mouth and shut up. Shut up and listen to me because I'm trying to get your attention. And stop your talking. And stop bringing your petitions to me. I'm not saying he doesn't hear petitions. Absolutely he does. We're dealing with a different perspective. Mm -hmm. He's saying stop it. Be still. And know. I am God. Exalted among the nations. Exalted on the earth. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Go to Exodus, and this is closing. Exodus 14.
backdrop, the Egyptians are chasing. Let's just call it the kingdom of Satan. Are chasing Israel and, and we're Israel. We, we are the body of Christ. Did you take us into the wilderness to kill us? How many of you have complained like that to God? God, are you trying to kill me? But Moses said to the people, or let, let, let's forgive me for using a little poetic license. God's trying to communicate to us. 1 Corinthians 10 says these in the Old Testament serve as an example to us so that we see. Moses says, oh, God will raise up another prophet greater than Moses. And that's Jesus Christ. But Jesus, Moses through the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit being God, said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation. He will provide for you today. For the Egyptians or the kingdom of Satan, you see today, you'll never see again. I'm not saying we don't struggle, we do. The Lord will fight for you. You must remain quiet. Be quiet. The Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to break camp. As for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. Has God given you what to do? Go back to that last place and say, Lord, what did you tell me to do that I'm not doing? Henry Groover, who was a prayer walker, who's with the Lord now, he would say this, and he's had unbelievable testimonies. He would say, always go with peace and a song. There, the song is the joy of the Lord. If, if you at any time lose that peace at any time the song stops if it ever goes away get back to that spot and say Lord what's going on that peace and song isn't there this is not a religious or hard and fast rule these are principles if, if things are like literally being like and after we finish Dietrich Bonhoeffer we're reading that testimony we're going to read the silver chair and you will see in the silver chair the one character Jill was told to go was told by Aslan the Jesus figure different signs and she was going and, and she had the additional directives but yet in the middle of the night she was staying at the giants, which she didn't know would eat them, or were going to eat them. Aslan kept speaking to her in, in, in her dream. And he said to her quietly, what were the signs? What were the signs? What were the signs? What were the signs? And she woke up and she repeated the signs and said, oh God, you were directing me and I lost my way because I chose something that which I saw rather than where you were taking me. And God was doing this. He was nudging her. I mean, they were going to see the, the giants, heavy snowstorm, literally pushing them back. And throughout the whole time, then they look out the window and they see a writing that was, I believe it was go north. Or I, I don't know, I don't remember what it was, but under me, that's what it was, under me, that Jill Eustace and Puddle Glum said, they've essentially repented and said, oh God, we have not followed what you told us. What is that noise? The train. The train. Oh, okay. Um, and they repented and they sought a way to get out and then they got to where they were. God was quietly nudging them to get them to where they need to be. Is God nudging you to a place where you're like, shoot, I, I'm running into difficulty. 
God, I can't break through. You better stop. Be still. Lord, what are you trying to do with me? Do I need to go back to where you're telling me? What have I done? What am I doing? Because in doing that, that is the discipleship process that God does with you. That's you learning to hear his voice. You will always go through that. But the practice of being still has to be there. What is God doing? And uh, I was going to close with Exodus, but I have to give a final warning. Revelation 12. The Lord just brought it to mind. And this is how you know to be still. Revelation 12, verse 7. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought. But he could not prevail. And there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan. Listen to this next phrase. The one who deceives the whole world. He's thrown to earth and his angels with him. And then go to verse 15. From the, his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river flowing after the woman, the church, to sweep away, sweep her away, the church. You can't sweep away the church in a torrent. But the earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river that the dragon had spewed from his mouth. So the dragon was furious with the woman and left to wage war against the rest of her offspring. The offspring of the church are those who keep God's commands and have the testimony about Jesus. Now, let me, keep, let me highlight to you what are God's commands. Jesus came, you do what he tells you. And that is based on a personal relationship with him. This is not saying go back to Torah. No, that's a bewitching spirit. That means you get before him in a quiet place. You learn to listen to him. I will not tell you what that is. That's, it's up to him. I mean, I've shared with you what God's given me. And the testimony of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. All about him. But the devil doesn't come after you with violence. He does. That's not the primary way. He doesn't come after you with drugs, sex, all that stuff. He comes after you with, what does it say in verse 9? The one who deceives the whole world. He will get you off track. He doesn't need you to start cursing God. He doesn't need you to fall into abject immorality. He just needs you to get your eyes off of the king. Because in heaven, he was... He was the chief musician until he got kicked out because he wanted the throne for himself. He wanted the glory for himself. We see that in Isaiah 14. If he can do that, if he can keep your eyes away from the king, he's won. He just needs to render you ineffective. He just needs to you to go round and round and round the circle. He just needs to get you in debates with other people, conversations and controversies over stupid, foolish arguments that mean nothing. We should be lifting Christ and Him crucified. And if that's not happening, walk away! Lose that person. They're not worth it. Not at that moment. I'm not saying they're not worth it to preach the gospel. I'm saying you were God, uh, excuse me. I'm saying the enemy is trying to steal your attention. If you can't get anywhere in terms of the gospel with this person, walk away. Walk away. Enough. Say, you know what? I gotta go. God bless you. I'll chat with you later. You don't need to be mean about it. You just, look, I, I got to get back to work. I'm sorry, I got to run. You just, they don't need an elaborate explanation. They just need to know you, you got to go. <laughs> Be gracious, it's fine. Because if the Lord wants you to talk to them, he'll bring them back to your attention. You don't need to seek them out. Remember, your allegiance to the king. You're a soldier in, in, in Christ's army. You better do as the commander does. Not what the lower, not, not the, what the outsiders tell you. No, you do what the king says. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you for your word. You've delivered it. I've given my soul. I've lifted my soul. I've delivered it. Have your, your way, oh Jesus. Bless your name. We love you. We thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your...
convicting power through your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you bring us to your grace. May our mirrors always be clean. May we always have our mirrors pointed to you. And may we always seek to have it clean. Expose us, O oh God, and cut us deep. Cut us by your word. Jesus, may the cross be evidenced. May we take, bring up the past so we may take it to the cross and confess it and find forgiveness through your blood. In Jesus' name, Jesus. Amen. amen.